Okay. 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 Um, Paul, uh, could you uh, tell uh, tell us uh, about you? Uh, so, uh, where you, where do you come from, uh, and what you studied, and uh, your first uh, work uh, experience? Sure. Uh, well, hi everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you about these things. Um, so yeah, I'm Paul Stacy. I'm well. I'm from Canada. This is where I'm in Vancouver, Canada. That's uh, I grew up in Canada, and um, and in terms of uh, my studies, well, I have four different degrees: um, a degree in biology, so a science degree. I have an arts degree in psychology. Uh, I have an education degree, so I am a qualified teacher. And then I have a graduate degree in something called adult learning and global change. Um, so, uh, so rather than specialize in a narrow niche, I have uh, studied across all disciplines generally. And so I'm uh, pretty good at science and arts and education. Um, and obviously education sort of links those, those things together in a nice way. Uh, my first, well, my first professional job after the, that education was really um, as a teacher, I, I taught autistic children, uh, children who couldn't read, write, or talk. Uh, so that was actually quite challenging when you're a teacher. If you take away those things, you know, if you're not able to teach using uh, reading or writing or those kinds of things, then um, it's quite a challenging task. So uh, fascinating work, but I, I moved from that into uh, technology in the 80s, 1980s, and I specialized in developing training programs for uh, teaching people how to use Apple Macintosh computers when they first came out. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, it's been an interesting process to go from those origins to what I do now. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, how did you uh, come to Creative Commons? Uh, what's uh, your, um, your role uh, uh, in the organization and uh, your main uh, achievements uh, in Creative Commons? Yeah, well, so actually maybe just to pick up the thread from where I left it. So I, I did work this work with computers in the, in the 80s and that led me to actually work uh, on air traffic control education programs. So I actually um, developed uh, education programs for air traffic controllers and implemented them around the world. Um, and after that, I helped create a new university from scratch. So I spent four years creating a new university. And then, and then I went to uh, help create another new initiative, which here in British Columbia, Canada, is called BC Campus. And um, I was hired to help create that organization. And from, well, really for, for nine years, I led an initiative that the Ministry of Education supported here in Canada around developing online learning courses um, and providing them for credit to people distributed in rural communities as well as urban communities. And uh, for those nine years, uh, that was an initiative of open education. All of the funding had to be used to create curricula that was shareable, shared cool. with others. Uh, so openly licensed. So for, for nine years, um, I did that work around open education at BC campus. And that led me to wanna to do that work globally because the work I was doing at BC campus was regional here in British Columbia, Canada. And I thought there was a fantastic opportunity to look at open education around the world and to foster the kinds of innovations we were uh, pursuing here in Canada elsewhere. So at Creative Commons, I joined as a associate director of education, of open education at Creative Commons, and worked with a team of people there to support the use of Creative Commons licenses to openly um, license and make available education materials uh, for reuse by educators and students around the world. Um, I, I suppose at Creative Commons, I did a number of things. 
Um, when I was first starting, there was a, it was during the Obama administration and there was a, a new initiative called the Trade Adjust Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Program, a real mouthful, uh, but it was a, a $2 billion program to incentivize the higher education system across the United States it to was, develop. Uh, this program is uh, uh, everything we found for the government, uh, but, uh, it was a, a mixed uh, financial, or uh, everything is um, a public fund. Everything is public funds. Yes, okay. the funding came from the government, the US government, actually okay. from the Department of Labor at the US government. Okay. And their interest was in like reskilling people who had been displaced from work because of outsourcing to offshore companies. They wanted to reskill those people to be in high growth jobs. And so uh, the colleges and universities across the US were incentivized to create these new academic offerings that would that would transition people from being unemployed to being employed in high growth sectors. And a condition of receiving funds from the government was that they had to openly license everything and make it shareable curricula using Creative Commons. But at that time, open education, open licensing, relatively new ideas, and many of the colleges and universities really didn't know what that involved. So. I was one of the people that helped support them understand what it means to put a creative license, a Creative Commons license on something and how it works. And um, so that was pretty interesting work. I also, uh, Hillary Clinton at the time was the Secretary of State and she launched a program called Open Textbook or the Open Book Initiative actually, I think it was called. And that was for the Middle East and North Africa region. So I also supported open education initiatives in that region. And, uh, and at Creative Commons, I also helped lead and facilitate something called the Open Leadership Institute, which trained people who were in leadership positions to, uh, to lead open initiatives around licensing, not just in education, but in galleries and libraries and museums in the culture sector um, and also around open access research. And then uh, the last thing I did when I was at Creative Commons was um, develop the Creative Commons certificate program. So uh, the certificate program you can currently take from Creative Commons was um, one of the things I led the creation of. Okay. Lots of things there. A lot of things, <laughs> yeah. A lot of great things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, you, you have been appointed uh, as uh, executive uh, director of uh, Open Education Global uh, in uh, 2017. Um, could you describe for uh, Francophone people uh, who discovered this organization, what uh, Open Education is about? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, well, so Open Education Global has been around for over 10 years now. It actually initiate, initially was created in relation to the MIT Open Courseware Initiative that was launched way back in 2003, I guess, somewhere around there. Um, and as uh, as you as many people will know from the MIT Open Courseware Initiative, MIT committed to make all of their courses, all of the materials associated with their courses, available online on the web openly licensed in a way that would allow anyone to use those materials to, uh, to kind of look at the courseware and to, to learn from that courseware. And that caused, uh, that was really quite an innovation at the time. And that led to many other countries around the world and many other institutions around the world wanting to follow suit. And so um, this organization, Open Education Global, uh, was created to support the global efforts to emulate what MIT's Open Courseware Initiative did. And, um, and it initially started that way, but it has since um, diversified and become independent of MIT. Uh, so we have relations with them, but we're no longer directly connected with them. And uh, in, in the context of what is meant by open education? It's a really good question. This could be a long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. I think um, open education is really an innovation around sharing knowledge. 
and it tries to make use of the innovations that have happened around digital technology, which enables sharing so readily. It's so easy in the digital world to make a copy of something, to easily distribute it to anyone around the world. And, uh, and so we began to, one of the things we enable is that practice in education. So rather than considering all courseware within a, a, a college or a university to be exclusively that of the particular faculty or professor involved. Instead, it's an effort to, uh, to join forces across a discipline and collectively create and share curricula materials to make them higher quality, more accessible, lower cost for students and, and for faculty to be able to have really academic freedom around modifying, customizing, and adapting materials to suit the ways in which they like to teach. So one part of open education is around the teaching and learning resources, uh, but another part of open education is around how the actual teaching and learning practice is done. And so you can also think about engaging students in activities that lead them to do assignments that are openly contributing to the betterment of the world, as opposed to assignments that are just simply done for a mark and then essentially thrown away. And then if I was to, to broaden open education beyond just teaching and learning, we can see open, this practice of open and sharing happening in other aspects of education too, including research, including open science, open data, even open source software and open source hardware are components that are part of the education ecosystem. And so there's a kind of big umbrella for open in education. And then I would say our organization, Open Education Global is primarily focused on the teaching and learning side of that uh, and, and engaging with um, educators, students, administrators and government around fostering the use of open education around the world. It was, a, it was clear. <laughs> Not too long. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, so you uh, you have uh, launched uh, launched uh, recently a strategic uh, plan for uh, open education. Um, could you please uh, tell us uh, the main objectives uh, and mean uh, of this plan? Sure. Uh, a strategic plan, of course, is intended to kind of lay out a roadmap for the work that you intend to do moving forward. Um, we called our strategic plan uh, open for public good. Okay. Um, so the focus of this plan is around uh, engaging people around the world and understanding that they can use open and the practices of open to make education more accessible, more available to everyone around the world who wants it. Um, we actually made this strategic plan have a date that goes from this year, 2021, to all the way out to 2030, which is when the UN Sustainable Development Goals are intended to be accomplished. So our strategic plan is also seen as enabling and contributing to the fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goals that, were, that all countries around the world are trying to fulfill by 2030. Um, our strategic plan sort of has three primary areas of focus which are very aligned to the work that we've been doing over these many years. Uh, so one, one of those areas of focus is something we call field building. <clears throat> Open education is a relatively new practice. And so you have to kind of uh, advocate for it, encourage adoption of it, and then support the use of it by teachers, by faculty, by students, encourage administrators to, to realize the strategic benefits of it. And that all involves kind of creating uh, and building a field of practitioners and adopters uh, all around the world. Um, while we're focused on global uh, open education, we also do support um, specific initiatives that take place within regions. So we do have a, a fairly significant initiative that uh, we lead in the United States, which is focused on community colleges and their use of open education. We have another initiative in Latin America that is focused on the use of open education in that region. And then 
Perrine and her colleagues are, are leading a wonderful uh, implementation of open education for the Francophone community. So uh, we, we kind of bridge both um, the global, what's, what's common about open education globally, and then what's unique and specific about it within particular regions. And we try to build the field for both those kinds of scenarios. Um, another area of focus is what we call knowledge exchange. Uh, people might call it professional development, but it's simply the, the exchange of best practices around how to do open education. This has been a field that's been unfolding now for a number of years. So we know a lot about what works and what doesn't work. And so uh, our organization is very active in creating opportunities for people to share best practices and to learn from each other, no matter where they are around the world, around what are the best ways to do open education. And that includes certificate programs, courses, and also informal means of enabling a community of practice to be built for the exchange of knowledge between practitioners. And then a third area of focus for us is something uh, we're calling in our strategic plan, value co-creation. Uh, this is an idea that is inherent in open education itself. And that is that value can be enhanced and magnified if it's done generatively with others, as opposed to a lone ranger independent effort to create education. So how do you think about connecting people across the education ecosystem to create education collectively as a collective community effort, as opposed to a singular effort by one person? And this, it, this aspect of open education is really a central component to how it works. And we're trying to bring focus to this uh, because it's a significant different way of operating than how education typically functions. So one of the things we're doing is saying, education's an ecosystem, it involves these many players. And part of our organization's role is to connect the players to each other to create value collectively. And so um, we definitely are very oriented towards uh, connecting educators to administrators and to government and trying to generate sort of top down support by decision makers for grassroots efforts that have happened uh, by the educators themselves so that we get that kind of meeting in the middle where both those things are happening and that uh, generates a lot of opportunity for the growth of open education around the world. Um, we have sort of three big events that we do every year that help with all of those things with both the field building, the knowledge exchange and the value co-creation, including Open Education Week, Open Education Awards for Excellence, and the, the, uh, the main Open Education Global Conference uh, is something that we also do annually every year. And this year it's being hosted by Nantes in France. Um, we are all very happy with that. <laughs> we hope that uh, this uh, interview and video will uh, help uh, people feeling proud of being member of the open education uh, world here in France and uh, in, in the Francophone world. We are sure they will, despite the, the, the bad condition uh, due to COVID. Well, there, was there another question, Florian? Yeah. Um, last word, uh, how do you intend to Francophone uh, to involve themselves in Yeah, so... In Nantes, yeah, so we, we are doing... Um, so our, our annual global conference uh, rotates around the world every year and is co-hosted by us with one of our members. We're a membership organization, I should mention that, I guess. Um, and this year we're doing it in partnership with the University of Nantes. Um, we also chose to do something very different this year. Um, and that is to, instead of doing a general academic conference about open education overall, we've decided to embrace and focus on the UNESCO Open Education Resources Recommendation, which was adopted 
and um, approved by the 193 member states of UNESCO back in November 2019. And that recommendation has five action areas in it that are intended to foster and help initiate, initiate open education in all countries around the world. Um, and we chose to focus this year's conference on that recommendation and help engage people in understanding what the recommendation is calling for and helping people make progress towards implementing what the recommendation uh, suggests uh, countries do. So uh, for this year's conference, we're still in a pandemic, of course, which makes it hard to do a physical in-person con uh, conference. So this year's conference is a hybrid. There's an online portion that will last for five days uh, at the end of September. And then we are hoping, uh, pandemic permitting, to have an in-person Congress in Nantes uh, for three days the following week. Uh, each of those components, the online conference and the in-person Congress, have um, um, a sort of multiple components. Uh, they focus on the five action areas of the recommendation, capacity building, access and inclusion, sustainability, international cooperation and policy. And there will be, um, we have had a call for proposals. Um, and interestingly, this year we did the call for proposals uh, in a way that uh, encouraged everyone to submit sessions in their native language or in one of the six official UNESCO languages. And so one of the ways the Francophone community can participate is by doing sessions at the conference in French as opposed to an English only kind of conference, which it has been in the past. And so we were, uh, we were very grateful to receive some proposals in French for the online conference. And I think there'll be an even greater opportunity for the Francophone community to support the in-person Congress in Nantes, which also will have sort of plenary sessions that deal with the five action areas, but then there will also be thematic sessions that deal with many of the, uh, the emerging areas of open education focus, everything from AI blockchain to open education in the K to 12 sector, for example. Those are a couple of the thematics. And the in-person Congress also will be doing learning labs. So for people who are looking to learn about how to do open education, there'll be opportunities for learning labs. And lastly, we're, we're having, um, we're hoping to uh, use the, the in-person Congress in Nantes to convene groups that are engaged in open education. So whether those are research groups that are looking at the impact measures associated with open education, we're hoping to be able to enable them to actually meet in person in Nantes and have a meeting room to, to kind of convene their research group. Um, but also there could easily be uh, in not a meeting of the Francophone community who are engaged in open education as a means of, of field building and networking together and learning from each other. So I think there are many opportunities actually for the Francophone community to participate in this year's conference, both online and in person. And uh, we're really excited about that. We think it's really um, uh, a bit of a, uh, experiment for us to, to do a conference like this, and especially to, to do a conference that is embracing all six of the official UNESCO languages. Thank you very much, Paul. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Very, yeah, very uh, to, uh, to take the time to, to speak with us. Um, because um, uh, with the Frank uh, initiative uh, uh, that uh, Perrin uh, uh, work with, uh, uh, we are very um, um, enthusiastic about uh, the opportunities, uh, for instance, to, uh, to be uh, able to, uh, what's the term in English, to meet, mingle in a, a mixed, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, different, uh, uh, approach uh, because uh, sometimes you can uh, because you are you are Canadian I suppose you know that the, the cultural point of view 
can very, very um, uh, change Absolutely. things. So it's very interesting uh, for me uh, and uh, everyone, I think, to be able to, um, to uh, exchange uh, between uh, one goal, but uh, with uh, several uh, perspective and point of view. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I completely agree. I think that that's one of the fascinating aspects of open education is just the, the way that it also enables multiple perspectives, multiple expressions of culture, and, uh, and also enables those people who want to reuse existing education materials to localize them to their own context or translate them into their own language and so on. There's a lot of those kind of benefits of open education, I think, enable and foster this, this more global recognition of multiple perspectives. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you, <laughs> okay. you tell, maybe uh, we will program uh, with uh, another interview, maybe after uh, uh, the global conference uh, of NEMS to, to, to have your, your, your <laughs> if, if you have time, of course, sure, but uh, of course, it yeah. will be very, very uh, blissful. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, to oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a delight. I welcome these opportunities to talk about open education. And, and so thanks for, um, thanks for making the interview possible. Sorry. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Florian and Romuald. You see, we have worked collectively. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. We'll meet right. again. We'll meet again. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.